welcome to the very first edition of the HBO Boxing Video Podcast. I'm Kira Mulvaney, and I'm joined by my co-host for the boring old audio boxing podcast, Eric Raskin. Eric, welcome to the wonderful world of HBO Digital Video. I hope it's every bit as exciting and glamorous as you thought it would be. Thus far it is. I'm very excited to be doing this. This is a historic day, really. You know, boxing, of course, uh, is a sport that for many years people listen to on the radio. Uh, you had... You know, I, I have a great uncle, 93 years old, still talks about uh, listening, huddling around the radio, listening to the Joe Lewis Max Schmeling fight. So it's not in- inconceivable that someday people will wax nostalgic about how they used to listen to Raskin and Mulvaney on the old HBO boxing podcast. Uh, I actually think it's barely conceivable at all, but it's great. It's a good thing to cling to. Right. You never can tell. You never can tell. Well, on this video podcast, we're going to look ahead. Uh, to the fights that we have coming up on the HBO Boxing Fall schedule, and it's quite the full, full festival of Fistiana, if I may say so. Wow, that's some serious alliteration. You know I, think? I think so. And we will be asking and answering some burning questions and maybe even looking at a CompuBox stat or two. Uh, or one. Or one. <laughs> <laughs> or two. Stay tuned. Right. Uh, that's true. Intrigue is good. Keep exactly. them waiting. But uh, spoiler, there's only one CompuBox stat we'll be discussing. Um, but, uh, yeah, we start. Uh, there are a lot of fights coming up on the schedule, and we start with a big one. Uh, this is uh, October 17th on HBO Pay-Per-View, Madison Square Garden, middleweights Gennady Golovkin, Triple G, taking on David Lemieux. And I'll start with a burning question for you here, Kieran. Triple G has 30 knockouts among his 33 wins. Sounds scary, but David Lemieux is not impressed. He has 31 knockouts among his 34 wins. So the burning question for this fight, will Lemieux hit Golovkin on the chin late on a Saturday night with his Sunday punch? And if so, what will happen? Well, this is the interesting thing, right? Because as I think we'll discuss a little bit more, uh, pretty much every one of Lemieux's punches is his Sunday punch. He's not known for his subtlety. I'm exaggerating for effect, but he doesn't necessarily work his way in and set it up. Every punch, he's going to come in winging big punches. So either he's not going to hit Golovkin at all, or at some point he's going to hit him. And we have seen Golovkin get hit in his fights. He's got a pretty good defense, but sometimes he allows guys to tee off on him, and he says he does it deliberately. I'm not so sure about that. But we will see. That is one of the intriguing things about this fight. We'll see exactly what happens when Lemieux does hit Golovkin with his biggest punch, and he is going to do that at some point, which leads me to my burning question to you, okay. is what's going to happen to Lemieux if he hits Golovkin and Golovkin just stands there, smiles at him, and comes forward. We've seen this happen with Lemieux before. His first defeat against Marco Antonio Rubio, basically he kept hitting Rubio, Rubio didn't fall over, Lemieux ran out of gas, and Rubio stopped him. Are we going to see something like that against Golovkin? I don't think so. We may see that result of Golovkin stopping Lemieux in the middle rounds as Rubio did. That's certainly possible, but I don't see it going down the same way for a couple of reasons. One is, this isn't that David Lemieux anymore. He's a different fighter now. In his recent fights, since he rebuilt himself, got himself back together, we haven't seen any of those stamina issues come into play at all. And he's gone deep into fights. Uh, the Gabe Rosado fight, he was still going strong 10 rounds in. Uh, the Hassan Endam fight, 12 rounds, he was still knocking Endam down repeatedly, even in the late rounds. So I wouldn't be too concerned about that stamina issue, about that likelihood that he's going to run out of gas uh, as a result of... Uh, you know, hitting Golovkin with his best punches, uh, not getting the desired result, and then watching him fade. We still may end up with (laughs) that result, uh, that he hits Golovkin, it doesn't have that effect, and eventually Golovkin hits him. But I don't see uh, the Lemieux that we saw in the Rubio fight, that particular fighter, losing in that sort of fashion to Golovkin. Uh, and so for this fight, here is our CompuBox stat. The, this, we've got one stat. Possibly that we want the to only one, here. but stay tuned. <laughs> um, so he, here are the numbers. We, we've talked exclu- exclusively so far about the power punches, giving and taking them. But uh, the biggest statistical difference between these two fighters actually is the jab. Golovkin lands as many jabs per round as anyone in the sport. Over his last nine tracked fights, he landed 9.1 jabs per round out of 29.9 thrown. A ridiculous 30.4 connect percentage. Lemieux, meanwhile, in six tracked fights, has landed only 3.2 jabs per round. And in his most recent fight, that Hassan Endam fight, he was outlanded by Endam in terms of jabs, 59 to 48. So it seems odd to even think about it in this fight. uh, But might we see Golovkin put on a jabbing clinic 
and try to outbox Lemieux from a distance rather than being in that seek and destroy mode. Well, I think this speaks a little bit to what we were just talking about, that Lemieux, his jab figures show that that's pretty much what he does. He comes forward and he's going to wing those big punches. And that's what he does. He motors forward. He is one gear and it's full forward and fifth or sixth or whatever your top gear is. He comes forward and he does that. But with Golovkin, as much as we talk about his power, and justifiably so, because even though he keeps saying he wants a distant fight, he can't do it. He keeps knocking guys out. There's a lot of boxing skill that goes into that. He has his terrific footwork to set his opponents up. He puts them where he wants them. He uses the jab to set them up. And then he tries to figure out what's going to be the other punch. It could be something else. It could be a right hand on top of the head like it was for Rubio. It could right. be it could be an uppercut. Uh, so I think we're definitely going to see Golovkin use a number of different tools, assuming he's able to do so in the face of Lemieux's firepower. Right, right. But yeah, so that's definitely something, though, for people to watch for is how big a role the jab plays and whether Lemieux can win this fight, despite the fact that he will inevitably lose the battle of the jab. Right. Something else that people are going to have to look forward to is the co-main event, which features 112-pound champion Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez taking on Brian Valoria. And a lot of folks may not have seen Gonzalez but once, maybe when he did his HBO debut back in May, and maybe they didn't even see that. And yet there are folks like you and me I think we both probably now, with Floyd Mayweather's retirement, have him at number one pound-for-pound fighter in the world. So what is it about this guy, for folks who haven't seen him or have maybe only seen him once, that has people like you and me so excited about him? And just to add on to that pound-for-pound point, the fact that he is number one on your list, number one on my list, he's also number one on the recently compiled ESPN.com list, which we both weigh in on, which... Number two on that list is Gennady Golovkin. So you're, you're seeing the very best pound-for-pound pound fighters in the sport on the same card here. What makes Chocolatito number one? What separates him? The guy can do everything. Uh, you want power. You want that, that KO artist who can just finish guys off. He's got that. Um, you want speed. You want technique. The jab, boxing from distance, moving inside and destroying a guy, going to the body. He can do Pretty much everything. I uh, I have yet to identify a flaw in Chocolatito. And when you're compiling these pound-for-pound pound lists, he really checks off both of the key boxes, which are what have you proven, what, ha- what can I point to definitively as what you've done, and the eye test. What are you doing right now? Mm. He checks off those both of those boxes. He's basically He's been a pro for about 10 years now. He's been on top dominating three separate divisions for seven, eight years now. Uh, He's really in his prime at 28. Uh, There are certainly fighters who might be able to compare with his resume, uh, but who don't pass the eye test in the way that he does. Then there's a guy like Golovkin who maybe scores just as high on the eye test. You watch him and you say, wow, that might be the best fighter in the world. But he hasn't beaten the caliber of opponent as consistently for as many years as Chocolatito has. So really... Uh, This guy is a marvel thus far, and there's a good chance that in Brian Valoria, he's taking on his toughest challenge yet, so that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he is an absolute joy to watch, no question about that. Yeah. And so my burning question for you here focuses on the other side of the equation, Mr. Valoria. He's had a long, outstanding career. Uh, He's the last man standing as a legit contender from that 2000 U.S. Olympic team. And he isn't necessarily slowing down at age 34. Some of his best wins have come in his 30s. My question for you... Is there any one fight you'd point to on his record in making a case that he can beat Chocolatito? Not necessarily that he can beat Chocolatito, and that's not a knock on Valoria, who I agree with you. I really like Brian Valoria as a fighter. He's had a tremendous career, and he's had three or four different chapters in his career. He's been a champion. He's been off the top. He's been back at the top uh, a couple more times. I just think that Chocolatito is that special that it's hard to make a case for anyone to beat him. But there is a fight that's intriguing that suggests that he can be competitive, and it's actually a loss. Hmm. Uh, During his third world title reign, he lost his title to Juan Francisco Estrada. Estrada's the only guy to really stretch Chocolatito, and I think we both also have Estrada in our top 10 pound-for-pound list, or thereabouts. Right. Um, He's shown that he's a really solid fighter, yet Valoria went to a split decision with him. So even though he lost to Estrada, and even though Chocolatito beat him, the very fact that this is the guy who's given Chocolatito the, the very hardest fight of his recent career perhaps suggests that maybe, you know, Valoria can be competitive at that level still. Interesting. Interesting that you single out the loss, but you're, you're right that being competitive 
again, that, that Estrada, that common opponent, you look at that, and it, it does uh, augur well, perhaps, for Valoria having a chance to be competitive in there. Indeed. So, well, one week after that, October 24th, we move uh, away from the bright lights of New York. We go to the CenturyLink Arena in Omaha, Nebraska, where uh, for a 140-pound contest, where champion Terence Crawford takes on Derry Jean. And uh, I was there when uh, Crawford first fought in front of his home crowd against Uriokis Gamboa, and it's still one of the very greatest fight night experiences that I've ever had. To be there, to see you know a hometown fight crowd cheering on their guy is just, really a thing to behold. Just rubbing it in that I wasn't there to enjoy Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay? I'll probably be doing that again on October the 25th. <laughs> um, so he's back there again. And here's the thing. That Gamboa fight was an incredibly exciting fight. And up until then, we knew that Crawford was a very skilled technical fighter. We'd seen him dissect and, and dismantle his opponents. Since then, though, he's been more than that. He's actually been an exciting fighter. That win over Gamboa, his wins over Ray Beltran and Thomas Delorme, they've been fun to watch. So my question to you is, is this going to be what we're going to see from Terence Crawford going forward? Or do you think that's just a fortunate the way that the matchups have happened, that he's just been in against the right people, the guys who have made him look good and exciting. And will we see that again on October 24th? I get the sense that we will see more of the Terrence Crawford that we have seen lately. Maybe not the guy from the Gamboa fight. That may be an outlier in terms of the fact that that was a legit fight of the year contender. Uh, that might have been just the right style, just the right matchup, the kind of risk taker opposite him who could throw hurtful punches, uh, take punches, go down, get up. Maybe that was just uh, you know, a, a perfect storm from an entertainment perspective for Terrence Crawford. But um, the fact that he has continued that trend of putting on entertaining fights since then, I don't think it's a fluke. This is not... I realize, yes, maybe we all thought he was more pure boxer than puncher. We're learning that there's some puncher there. There's some finisher there. Um, but... Certainly, even when we perceived him as more of a boxer, he was never Miguel Vasquez. He was never <laughs> Richard Abril. Uh, the guy he maybe reminds me of a little bit, not quite a current guy, but a fairly recent guy, Stevie Johnston, uh, a, a fellow lightweight champion um, who was a really skilled guy, but also made a lot of fun fights. Didn't stay on top very long, um, but could make really entertaining fights despite not having a ton of power, even less than Crawford. He was much less of a finisher. Um, but made good fun fights despite being a boxer first. I could see Crawford continuing to put on good fun fights. Maybe don't expect a fight of the year every time right. out. Uh, but but what we've seen those last couple f fights against uh, Beltran um, and Delorme, I, I think that pattern could continue. Yeah, and I think it's a deliberate decision on his part to be more exciting because... Right. We've seen him. He was uh, up 11 rounds to nothing against Beltran and still went out to try right. to get the stoppage in the 12th round. I think he knows that boxing's not just about skill. It's also about entertainment. Yeah, and I mean, that's something we see with a lot of top fighters that they uh, will go the opposite direction. They'll sort of take their foot off the gas and, and right. just just coast to the to the, to the the 12-round decision victory. And it's refreshing to see that Crawford doesn't have that mentality. Right. Um, so another question about this fight, my question for you, uh, concerns the division that he's now fighting in. He just moved out of the lightweight division, not a terribly deep division full of such thrilling names as Vasquez and Abriel and so forth. Uh, now Crawford has left and moved up to junior welterweight, which is a deep division and a division without a lineal champion now that Danny Garcia has moved up in weight. My question for you is, after he faces Jerry Jean, if he wins, who is the one opponent at 140 pounds uh, or thereabouts that you most want to see Crawford fight next. Pish posh with your 140 pounds, I say. <laughs> Terrence, I, I threw in an or thereabouts. Or thereabouts. Give me a little wiggle room. Terence Crawford, I think, I'm very, very high on Terence Crawford as a talent, and I have been for a while. And he is getting a greater awareness and appreciation, I think, partly because of his more exciting style now, among the broader boxing fan base. I think he's ready to kind of bust out and I've talked about this on our boring old 20th century audio podcast. <laughs> I want to see Terence Crawford t step up and take on Manny Pacquiao. That, I think, is a terrific fight for him. Um, they're both promoted by top rank. It's the perfect situation for top rank where they can ease the young lion in against, you know, the, 
the older guy. And I've said it before, and I will say it again. I think Terence Crawford takes Manny Pacquiao, and that's a fight I would like to see in 2016. Mm. Well, if your prediction of what would happen is correct, then I would think it's a fight Terence Crawford would like to see as, <laughs> as well. Maybe not a fight Manny Pacquiao would Maybe like not. to see. We, we won't tell him that you're picking <laughs> against him. All right, moving on to November 7th, the, Th- the Thomas and Mack Center in Las Vegas. We have a big welterweight fight between two crowd-pleasing veteran fighters here, Timothy Bradley against Brandon Rios. My burning question for you about this fight, Kieran, logic dictates that if it's a boxing match, Tim Bradley wins going away. If it's a brawl, it's anyone's fight. What are the chances that Tim Bradley does the smart thing and doesn't get lured into a my cojones are bigger than your cojones contest? Well, how often when he was with Joel Diaz, which he was for 10 years, we heard Joel in the corner going, just box him, just box him. And he might start out that way. And then before you know it, he, he's in a fight. Tim Bradley, who can be a, you know, a pretty cool and chill guy outside the ring, is also pretty hyper. And he's now teamed up with a trainer who's also renowned for being pretty hyper, Teddy Atlas. Indeed. Um, although Teddy's always been you know, pretty sharp in terms of tactics inside the ring. And yet, Part of the reason why they've hooked up together is because he feels that Atlas is going to be able to bring out his boxing again. Um, But a lot of that ultimately is going to depend on Tim. When we've seen him at his boxing best, it's been recently, it's been against Juan Manuel Marquez, which I think is still the seminal fight of his career, a terrific performance. And part of the reason for that was Marquez is a terrific fighter too, but he's he's also a boxer, not a brawler. It's when he is up against a guy who can fight better than they can box, and it starts to hit him, and he gets sucked into that. So I think it really depends. If Brandon Rios is too slow and too plodding and not able to really lay a glove on Timothy Bradley, I think Bradley will dance around him all night. If Rios is able to close that gap and put pressure on him and start to make it a fight, instead of taking the step back and trying to box him, Bradley's going to fight him. That's what's going to happen, which leads, with a perfect segue, (laughs) to my question for you, which is... What Brandon Rios are we going to see on this night? The, there have been many times, especially at 140, 147, where Brandon hasn't looked as if he's the best prepared guy in the world. And he would have said, and he has said, he hasn't always been in the best shape. He doesn't take the best care of himself between fights. Before his last fight against Mike Alvarado, he promised that he was in much better shape. And he looked sensational in January against Mike Alvarado. But How much of that was Brandon Rios looking genuinely very good and Mike Alvarado being terrible and admitting that he hadn't trained properly and was probably a bit shot? Um, Do you think we're going to see a Brandon Rios like the Brandon Rios we saw against Mike Alvarado against Tim Bradley? Or perhaps is he going to revert to the mean a little bit and maybe just be a little bit too slow, too plodding, maybe with a little bit too much weight to take on a guy like Tim Bradley? Yes, since we are discussing Teddy Atlas here, he's involved in this fight. This is probably a good time to quote one of his crazy televised rants recently where he yelled, against who? Against who? Against who? And several more against who's before he uh, settled back down. But I think that when you talk about the Rios-Alvarado fight, you have to ask that. Uh, Against who? Against what turned out to essentially be a heavy bag. Brandon Rios did look great in that fight, the best he's looked in several fights. It was very encouraging. He did appear to have been in shape. He made weight. That's always a a good start. (laughs) Um, So I would expect that we are not against Tim Bradley going to see a Brandon Rios who looks that good because he's up against an opponent who can cause him some problems, who is going to move a bit. As you suggested, Bradley's plan will be to box unless Rios can force him to do something different. So, you know, I think anyone who just because he got shut out or nearly shut out by Manny Pacquiao, who took that as a sign that, oh, Bradley's done, I I think that was excessive. I Mm -hmm. I think he's still a top fighter. Um, But there are certain stylistic challenges against Bradley, and Bradley is a a pound-for-pound level talent here, uh, that this is just going to be a really difficult fight for him to impose his will uh, and and force the kind of fight that he needs. And so I would be shocked if we come away from this fight saying that he looked as good as he did against right. Alvarado. It just doesn't seem possible right. against Timothy Bradley. Right. One guy who I think we probably will see look pretty good on this card. In the co-main event, we have featherweight action. Vasil Lomachenko taking on, I hope I can get this right, <laughs> Romelu Kwasicha. I cannot correct you if that is wrong. I'm I'm trusting you on this one. I was watching old fights of his to try and get it right. 
But that's how my fellow Brits pronounced it when he was fighting Lee Selby. So they must be right, right? Romelu Krasicha. So here's the thing with Lomachenko. He has had five professional fights. He's been a professional for just two years. Outstanding amateur career, of course. But he already looks like he's kind of running out of opponents. He was trying to get a big fight with Nicholas Walters, mm -hmm. but Walters just outgrew the featherweight division. Uh, there was talk about him possibly getting together with Guillermo Rigondeau, uh, but apparently, at least according to Lomachenko's camp, the Rigondeau wage demands were too much. Already entering his sixth professional fight, is Lomachenko a bit too good for his own good? Is he already in a situation where he's going to find it hard to find that defining fight in his division? I have that same concern. Uh, I'm not at the point where I'm giving up on these two fights that you <laughs> talked about happening. I'd certainly think it's possible that a Walters fight could still be made, maybe not in his division, which was part of the question you were specifying. In the division, he may have to go outside it. They may have to do a 128-pound catch weight or something like that to make that fight. I also think just because negotiations broke down with Rigondeau and he was demanding too much doesn't mean they can't return to the table. And my goodness, I'd love to see that right. fight. I mean, these are quite possibly the two greatest amateur right. fighters ever. Certainly, they're both somewhere in the top five or so. It would be just fascinating to watch them match up against each other. Um, so I still think those fights can happen. There are other interesting names in the weight class, um, but uh, makeability is a question. There are certain promotional conflicts. Uh, you can throw out names. Like, is someone that Lomachenko already beat, Gary Russell Jr., mm. is still a very talented fighter, bounced back well. If he continues winning, he may sort of earn a rematch. I could see that uh, possibly as a fight that people want to see. Leo Santa Cruz is another guy. So there are names in that division for him to fight. Are they makeable? It's not looking great right now, uh, but I would hope that one of out of all those names that we threw out there sometime in 2016, we might see one of those fights come together. And Lomachenko, whoever he's fighting, is one of those guys who you want to say, if you haven't seen this guy, just stop and right. watch. And watch what an incredible fighter he is. His footwork, his movement, I mean, just everything about this guy. He is, uh, he's one to watch. Yes, definitely. All right, we conclude with uh, the big fight on the full agenda. November the 21st from Mandalay Bay, where, as Don King always used to say, the flying fishes play in Las Vegas, Nevada. On HBO pay-per-view, uh, Saul Canelo Alvarez takes on Miguel, Miguel Cotto Cotto, for the lineal middleweight championship of the world. This is the true middleweight championship. And my burning question is around my friend Miguel Cotto who in his <laughs> last three outings with Freddie Roach as his trainer has looked sensational, blowing away Delvin Rodriguez, Sergio Martinez, and Daniel Gill. He's looked, there's been a bounce in his step, his jab has looked good, and most importantly, that left hook of his, that was always his big weapon when at the, the, the lower weights, is back in force. But those three opponents have been in order not very good, uh, gimpy, possibly <laughs> a little sharp, right. and weight drained, and also possibly not very good. So is this all a mirage? Is this all built on a house of cards? And are we going to see this all come crashing down against the young Canelo? That's the, the fascinating question here is what, who is the real Miguel Cotto circa 2015? Uh, we, we've seen these aesthetically, these great improvements under Freddie Roach. He looks so much better in the ring than he had prior to hooking up. You look at the Austin, uh, the Austin Trout fight, the Miguel Cotto that we saw in that fight, it just looks like a different fighter. But maybe that all owes to the style and the opposition. Maybe he's reborn under Freddie Roach. It's really hard to say this is the fight where we're going to find out. Uh, and uh, yes, I am sort of dancing around actually giving an answer, <laughs> rather kind of repackaging the question. But it's just know, impossible right? yeah. to know. Yeah. Um, I will say, if it is all a mirage, he's in big trouble. Canelo okay. is too good, too young, too strong, uh, improving with every fight. Uh, so if it's a mirage, this is a fight that Miguel Cotto can't win if he is the worst case scenario Miguel Cotto. Right. Um, but if he, if it's not a mirage, if, if he has got his mojo back, uh, Boy, this is one of the, those all-time coin flip kind of fights where then maybe the question will become, what does Canelo have? Right. What can he do? Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe it'll be Miguel Cotto as asking those questions of Canelo, are you ready for this? And that's certainly the fight that we're right. all hoping it will turn out to right. be. Uh, and my burning question for you on this fight, uh, it's a bit of a strange one. 
a, a short question right to the point here. Who has more to lose in this fight? Phrased another way, which of these two superstar fighters has more at stake? Yeah, I don't think it's a strange one. I think it's a good one, actually. And I've been thinking about it a fair bit. And my first inclination would be to say Canelo Alvarez because he has the world at his feet right now. Um, Mayweather supposedly has retired. Manny Pacquiao is close to the end of his career. Canelo attracts massive, massive crowds to his fight. He has the potential to be the number one box office star in the sport. And were he to lose, not just to Miguel Cotto, but to a hated Puerto Rican uh, in this great Mexican-Puerto Rican rivalry in boxing, what would that do for his drawing power? Would he still be able to to bring all those people to his fights. But conversely, he's still very young. Right. He has an awful lot of his career still ahead of him. He's got a lot of fights, but he's still a kid. Um, he has plenty of opportunity, and I still think he's very, very good. Cotto, on the other hand, on one hand, his legacy is set. He's going in the Hall of Fame. Uh, if he hadn't been before when he won the middleweight title, he absolutely secured that. Um, but at the same time, Maybe, maybe there's a tiny question mark against Cotto because he's been one of the very greatest fighters of his generation. But when he stepped up to the very biggest fights against the other very best fighters of his generation, he's come off second best right. against Manny Pacquiao, against Floyd Mayweather, and also then there's been a couple of other uh, missteps in there as well. And uh, if he loses this, he's done. If he wins this, he might be done still. He's at the end right. of a, a fantastic career. But... Uh, I kind of wonder, given that Canelo has the opportunity to correct whatever happens against Cotto if it doesn't go well for him, I kind of think Miguel Cotto is the guy with a little bit more at stake here. He's a proud man, and he is going to want to bring his career close to a conclusion, if not actually to a conclusion, with a victory over the young guy from Mexico. So I'm going to say Cotto's got a little bit more at stake. Interesting. And, and isn't it funny how we reassess fights after they happen that we were saying going into the Martinez fight, that this is a guy who's right. lost uh, in his biggest step up, steps up, but if he beats Martinez, that's the <laughs> crowning victory that, right. that, that people will point to as his greatest achievement and his greatest performance and his greatest win, and he won, and he dominated. Yeah. And now we put a little asterisk <laughs> next to right. it. We say, well, but gimpy, right. gimpy. And so uh, this is now another chance, as you said, for him to get that win that we all point to and say that was Miguel Cotto's crowning moment, defining performance he has another chance for here against Canelo. Yeah, absolutely. And then he would end up with his career with arguably two of the three greatest wins of his tremendous career or coming in his very last couple of fights. So uh, that would be the way to go out if that's uh, if that's uh, what he wants to do afterwards. Well, thanks very much. You'll be able to uh, uh, listen in on November 22nd to hear us completely try to change our minds about our prediction for that fight and the, <laughs> for all the others. Uh, we will continue to uh, put a lot of uh, work into talking about and previewing all these fights on the full schedule on our podcast, uh, our old-fashioned audio podcast. And Eric, where can people hear that? Well, they can hear it uh, on SoundCloud. Uh, they can subscribe on iTunes, listen that way. They can listen on Stitcher. Many different ways uh, to listen to the audio podcast, that old-school thing that we do uh, from time to time. And if you want super old school as well as audio, we can actually find written words about HBO <laughs> boxing as well as some videos on our boxing blog. That is inside hboboxing.com. So please do check that out. Thanks very much for watching. Please do listen to our podcast. Check out our blog. I am Kira Mulvaney. And I am Eric Raskin. 